Good evening, everyone, and welcome to what I hope will be a fascinating evening. Tonight is one of the series of events that we put on to mark the uh, 150th anniversary of the United Synagogue. On this day, the 14th of July, 1870, the United Synagogue was created by an act of parliament. The vision of the lay leadership and of the chief rabbi of, of that time of the uh, amalgamation of five London synagogues was an incredibly visionary move that actually brought about the strength of the Ashkenazi community in the UK. Today, we are proud to be a community of over 62 synagogues, and we are proud of the vision that our leaders had then, and we sit here today, and I'm proud to be president of an organization that is one of the largest charities, and I would argue the most important charity in the UK today, as we deal with the fundamental needs of Anglo Jewry in terms that people have a way in which we can associate as a community. Tonight, we have a panel of speakers who have been brought together from four different of our United Synagogues. I'd like to introduce them first. Firstly, we have uh, Robertson Rachi Lister of Edgware Synagogue, Rabbinet Batia Friedman of Hansa Garden Synagogue, my old school friend and former Ilford Synagogue choir boy, Rabbi Yehuda Le Black of Kenton, and last and by no means least, Rabbi Yitzhak uh, uh, Shochet, my own rabbi of Mill Hill Synagogue. But the, the, the interviewers have been brought together tonight to, into, to, to interview someone who needs little introduction. Lord Levy is a well-known and, and respected leader, not only in our own community, but in the wider British society. I can do no more than actually read from the words that I said seven years ago when I was privileged as the chair of Mill Hill Shul to be uh, uh, in charge of the opening of the Nair or Community Centre that houses the Annie and Samuel Levy Hall. I said then, Lord and Lady Levy, Gilda and Michael, those of, you who try, those of us who try and our part in the leadership of our community but can, can but be in awe of all that you have achieved, whether it is here in Mill Hill in the Anglo-Jewish community, in Israel, or in the wider British society, your contributions are enormous. Michael, I know how important it is for you to have your late parents' names associated with this hall as it was with its predecessor. It is wonderful that after so many years since their passing, they still have an influence over you. It says much for the people that they were and also for the respect that you show them as parents, an important lesson for us all. Thank you both very much. Words that are equally apt today as they were seven years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy it this evening and I hand over to Rabbi Shochet. Firstly, thank you, Michael Goldstein, for opening up this evening and um, with those especially warm and indeed, as you say, apt words. And let me at the same time say, Lord Levy, and express my personal gratitude to you for agreeing to come along tonight, making the time, because I know that even in lockdown, you're busier than most people might be outside of lockdown, but you've agreed to give us the time tonight to be able to go through this process and share your insights is, is extremely appreciative. So I guess it's only appropriate to jump right in and, and begin with the here and now. I mean, COVID-19, coronavirus, it's been mad, it's been chaotic. The first and foremost question, and really in three parts is above all else, how are you? Um, what has been your biggest challenge during these last several months? What is your view of the government handling of it? And where do you see us all heading? Well, thank you. Firstly, muzzle talk to United Synagogue, <coughs> excuse me, on its 150th anniversary. And to you, Michael, a very dear friend. Um, we're very proud that one of our own here in Mill Hill is president of the United Synagogue, and you're doing a terrific job. Um, Rabbi Shochet, you're my own Rav, and therefore um, it's a privilege to be questioned by you, um, and let me deal with your question. This has been a very, very difficult period. Um, I have lost four people during this time that have passed on that were friends. One of them, one of my dearest friends for the last 50 years, Michael Goldmayer who two out of four um, Friday nights, we had shut up dinner together. 
He was with us just three weeks before he died for Shabbat dinner with Philippa. From our own shawl, Rabbi Stanley Michaels, who I saw every Shabbat for the last 30 years. Rabbi Avram Pinter, who phoned me as he was admitted to intensive care at University College Hospital, could hardly breathe. I hardly recognized his voice. I said, Avram, is that you? And he said, Michael, it's me. I'm being admitted now to the intensive care. Ten days later, he passed away, and I was able to help to get the body out to Israel through the Leviah. And then my lawyer in Israel of 40 years standing, Michael Shine, he was not COVID-related, but also died. So it's, it's been a very tough period. And for someone like me to be locked in at home now for four months, although I do a lot, and although we have guests in the garden, and you yourself, Rabbi Shachod, have been here the last few weeks to learn in the garden as opposed to on the phone every Friday morning, as we always do. It's a very difficult period. I'm used to having lunch three, four times a week in town, being in the Lords, having two or three dinners, we had to cancel some very important um, dinners uh, during this period. So it's not been an easy period. You then go on as to how the government has handled this and what is the way out of it and the way forward. The last thing I want is for this interview to be a political interview. I've done too many of those over the years. But if you look at the reality and what's happened, and where the UK is today, compared to so many nations of the world, we're in a very, very bad way. When a plane came in from Wuhan on the 31st of January, the first cases were in York. That night was the official leaving of the EU. There was a big Brexit party in Downing Street. There were lots of parties going on and a few days before a Cobra meeting had taken place, the Prime Minister was not at it. Two weeks later, I think the 13th of Feb, the Cabinet was reshuffled. There was then announced the divorce of the Prime Minister. There was then announced his engagement and that his fiancée was expecting their child. He didn't attend, then he went on holiday for a couple of weeks. And then there was a big dinner and he didn't attend the first Cobra meeting until the 3rd of Jan and there was still a 3rd of March forgive me and there was still a blase attitude we're the best we're coming through this there aren't problems now we sit here in July we all know the number of deaths who knows how many could have been avoided I really don't know our NHS has coped brilliantly but this has been a terrible period for this country. For us to have the third number of cases of deaths in the world after America and Brazil is shameful. When you have a country like South Korea in the hundreds and so many other countries, um, and okay, you look at the population sizes as well, but we've really, really, in my opinion, not handled this very well. Um, I'm not saying a, another party in power would have been that much better. I'm not saying that. That's not the purpose of the answer that I'm giving to you, Rabbi Shocker. But I don't think that we've handled this well at all. In my capacity as president, in my capacity as president of Jewish Care, this has been the most difficult period that the organization has ever faced and not specific to Jewish care, but generally what's happened in care homes, having to take residents back from hospital when they weren't tested. And just only a few weeks ago, were all residents and all staff tested. That's been a very, very difficult period. And having to provide our own PPE equipment to get the best equipment has also been extraordinarily difficult. I think the third part of your question, Rabbi Shokot, was how do we get out of this? I wish I were wise enough to know the answer to that. I hear all sorts of things in the papers today. They were talking about another outbreak and the potential between September and next summer of 120,000 further deaths. I just don't know. 
I do know that hospitals are being put on alert for another outbreak in the next few months. And I find that very, very frightening. So I hope, Rabbi Shachat, that gives you, to the best of my ability, the, the answer to the three parts of your question. Okay, thank you for that. Well, um, let's move on to something a little bit different. In fact, let's go all the way back to the beginning. 27 years ago, I do remember the very first time I met you um, on the Shabbos. It wasn't my first Shabbos in Millville because you weren't there, but it was the second Shabbos when you were back from holiday in August. Um, and then a short while later, I met somebody by the name of Jeff Shear, who, of course, had worked very closely with you over so many years. And he told me, and this is the way I was essentially introduced to you, Lord Levy, or then you were still Michael Levy, uh, is known as, we call him the Boston Strangler. And he said, because when he gets his hands around you, he will not let go until he gets what he wants out of you. And it is a given that over the course of the years, JFS, Jewish Care, JLGB, and so much else besides, many, 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 many millions have been raised by yourself. Straight up, what's the secret? Well, God, 27 years ago, I'm still Michael Levy. I'm privileged and honored to have the title uh, Lord Levy, but as far as I'm concerned, to everybody, I'm Michael. Wow, Boston Strangler, that sounds very ominous. That sounds very scary. I don't think I fundraise in a scary way. And if you multiply the billions, uh, millions, excuse me, to hundreds of millions, and probably today going towards the billion pound mark for all sorts of charities, and particularly in our own Kahila, in our own community and Anglo Jewry. I think it's just a matter of going up to someone and asking them. You don't strangle them. My form is to hug. I wish I could hug at the moment, but there you go. No hugging at the moment. But really to look at someone in the eyes, tell them about the charity, why you're asking them, you have to believe in the cause that you're asking. You have to be absolutely confident in the governance of that charity, what that charity stands for, and have every confidence if they ask you a question about that, that you can answer it. And as long as you've got that, there is no shame in asking anyone for money. You know, Rabbi Shochet, the worst that anyone can say is, no, sorry, Michael, we don't want to give. That's the worst is they can decline. And you know, very often, people are proud to be asked. When you ask someone, they think, well, Michael's asking me. I must listen to what he has to say. What is the charity? And somehow you can often really release something within a person where they want to give, where they want to give tzedakah, they want to give charity, but they haven't really been asked. And it's amazing. I mean, I remember a case where someone said, Michael, I want you to go to a dinner. This was on Jewish care. There's someone there we think is a wealthy man, but he's never really been asked. And the maximum he'd given is £10,000 at this particular dinner. I went to the dinner, befriended him, took him around the Jewish care facilities. And a number of years later, he contributed to Jewish care alone about 10 million, to JFS a million, and to various other charities, both within our community and outside of our community. So often it's people want to be asked, Rabbi Shocher, but they're not asked. And people somehow, as they say, for Shemon, they're ashamed to ask somebody. Never be ashamed. You're not asking for yourself. I've never asked anyone for a cup of tea for myself. If you're asking for something you believe in, I hope the Boston Strangler, Jeff, was joking, because my style is a warm hug, looking in the eyes. And by the way, if you know, you do your homework on somebody as well. And if you know someone's having a difficult time and they have been a generous donor, you always look after them. You give them the equal amount, if not even more, Derek Herrits and respect during the time they're having difficulty, because they remember that. And more often or not, these people will come back and then they will absolutely do the right thing when they come back. So hopefully it's an explanation. I've given a number of lectures on fundraising. 
which would be much more comprehensive, mainly in the wider society. Um, but there's no secret. It's about asking and asking with respect, asking with dignity, and the worst that can happen is someone is going to say no. Thank you for that. Yes, it was obviously said at the time, just he was reflecting on your unique accomplishments, if I understood you correctly, because I was going to ask. It's obviously near the billion pound mark of what you've managed to raise over all this time, which is unbelievable. But I want to finish with this question before I hand over to the next interviewer. That is simply that there is a mindset, obviously, in the generation from which you have largely raised that are more traditional in terms of their giving, that stuck a concept, etc. Is there a very real concern or is there already evidence, in fact, that as we go into the next generation, which is arguably younger, more spoiled, millennials or whatever it is, boomers and whatever they may be called, who for a start sometimes end up having to share the wealth amongst their siblings, but are perhaps, you can correct me if I'm wrong, less inclined to give. And if that is the case, does that pose a greater problem going forward? Rabbi Shocher, that's a very interesting question that certainly I've said around many tables where that same question has been asked. I like to believe that every generation will have its own qualities and will deliver in a different way. My generation hopefully has proudly represented Anglo Jewry and built some of the great institutions that we have. Generation before that built an institution like the United Synagogue. The generation going forward we certainly have some very good people in their 50s, and I believe in their 40s and 30s. As to how they come forward in terms of their charitable giving, I believe the answer, I have to believe, and I have to feel confident that that generation will come to the table, will be supportive of our community and Anglo jury, because I do believe that they will rise to the occasion. Every generation has its own way of doing things, but every generation in one way or another does rise to the occasion. And I firmly believe that this next generation and the generation after, in their way, and it may be different, and they may focus much more on home charities, but I do believe, yes, that they will come forward and they will support our community, and the charities that we know desperately will need their support. Thank you so much, Lord Levy. And that gives me pleasure to hand over to Rebison Lister from Edry United Synagogue, who will carry on with some questions that have been presented to her from her own community. So over to you, Rebison Lister. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Lord Levy. I'd like to wish a mazel tov to the United Synagogue for 150 years. And just to say that I'm so proud and my husband and I to serve in this organization. Uh, Lord Levy, you are an example to all of us with all your uh, charities. You are an example to how to lead a life, how to live with money for all of us. Um, and I would like to just ask you and take you right back. What was your childhood like? And what made you, what was the tipping point that made you into the dedicated philanthropist and charitable worker that you are? Well, Robert, it's a mystery. It's lovely to see you. And um, thank you very much for your um, question. So my childhood could not have been more different. My late father, Obi Shalom, ran a shawl in Stoke Newington. It was an independent shawl, not part of the U.S., and um, we lived in one room and I had to go to the public bath on a Friday for Shabbos. If I could bunk off, I would. It wasn't a very pleasant experience. And my dear mum, God rest her dear soul, Sifana Vebracha, she um, used to stretch a meal from one to three um, to make sure that we, we ate. I went to school, I had to go to Cheda Hebrew classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening after school, had to learn with a Rob on Shabbos afternoon, and then had to go to Cheda Sunday morning for three hours. So that was my upbringing. And I was fortunate in life. And in my, I got married very young, married now 53 years. 
and um, I was able to start giving Sadaka in my 20s and somehow realized that I had this ability to ask people. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning it was difficult because I was asking people that were much older than I was. Um, but I was able to do it. And somehow I realized that if I had that skill set, whatever it was, I should try and use it to the maximum. So that's really how it started. Um, I also perhaps have such respect and Derek Eretz for our Rabbonim and for those who serve our communities because I didn't necessarily see that when I was growing up. In those days, I didn't think a Rob or a Shamus was treated perhaps as the Derek Eretz that they should have been. And I learned a lot from that. And I vowed that as I grew up, I would change that. And in actual fact, I changed the whole situation of salaries in terms of professional staff in our communal organizations, because I believe that they should be paid properly as though they would be in commerce. And I think it's very important that lay leadership absolutely respect those who dedicate their lives to our community, whether it's our Rabbonim, whether it's our professionals in our community life. And that to me is very, very important. So I could go on, but I want to try and answer the question succinctly. Um, but that's where it, it started. And I used to walk from Stanford Hill to Lee Road to take a children's service on Shabbos. And then I used to go from Stanford Hill to Croydon to teach on a Sunday morning. So it was two hours each way by bus and train, three hours teaching, seven hours for the princely sum of a pound. But there you go. So that gives you a little taste, Sir Reverson Lister, of uh, my formative years and, and how things developed. Okay. So, but you are, you started off your business life in music and then you seem to change and dedicate your life to supporting charities to looking around you, supporting the Labour Party. What was it that changed you that didn't keep you into business, took you out of it, stop and look after the community around you, the world, the country around you? What was that tipping point? My mother's death. Um, I was first of all in professional practice. Then as you so rightly say, I was in the music business had a very successful business. Daddy died when he was young at 65, when I just started the business. Mummy then had an amputation, which got me involved in the then welfare board and helped to create Jewish care. And then mummy went into coma and I sat with her every day and I felt she gave me a message, Michael, change your life. And after the Shloshim, after the period of mourning, I actually phoned my lawyer and said, although well, he was on my board of directors, I want a private dinner. And I said, I'm selling out. And he said, what do you mean, Michael? Now's not the time. I said, it doesn't matter. It's not the money. I want to change my life. I felt that she couldn't talk to me. Obviously, she was in coma. I thought she gave me a message, Michael, now's the time to change your life. I didn't know how to interpret it, um, but my interpretation was that I should get out of the rat race totally in business, not just fight for that every day, but try and make a difference. And that's, although I did start another business, didn't, I never had my heart in it and sold it fairly quickly. I really then decided that helping the community, and in those days helping Israel, I was one of the two governors on the Sochnut, in those days the then head of Marks and Spencer was the, the co-governor with me, and I was in those days the world head of Aliyah Tanah, Yuz Aliyah, and I just felt that that's where my time was better spent and my energy was better spent. And then I met Tony Blair at a dinner party, I felt that I'd not been involved politically here, funny enough I was more so involved in Israel. Um, I took to him and I thought, you know, we just became friends, um, Robertson Mister, you know, 
No one thought he'd be the leader of the Labour Party, let alone the Prime Minister. And um, one thing led to another. And if you'd have said to me, as a young kid growing up in Stamford Hill, the son of the Shamas, that one day you'd be in the Lords and one day you'd be tantamount to Foreign Secretary and the personal envoy of the Prime Minister, I'd have said, you know, you just had a little too much to drink. <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen in life. And as I, when I've spoken to youngsters and youth, always take every opportunity, grasp it, because you never know where that will lead. But this really started when my late mother, who I worshipped, wow. um, basically gave me that message when she was in coma. And I, and I am Ben Yochid, I'm an only child. And it was all very traumatic. It was actually before Rabbi Shochet's time when Rabbi Cutler was in our shul. And I took a call on Rosh Hashanah um, from the hospital. The phone never rings on Rosh Hashanah. Um, could you please get to the hospital as soon as possible? And I said, Mummy knows I'm not coming for two days. It's our Jewish New Year. No, you don't understand. We're going to have to amputate in a few hours at home. And I went to Shul, said some to Helen, and then got to the hospital. Met my doctor there and came as well. He had a few dried biscuits for a Rosh Hashanah lunch. And her arm was amputated. And that, frankly, that changed my life completely. Uh, you have done her proud. Um, Lord Levy, I've heard, I've heard you speak about the great good that can come out of the connection of the public sector, the business sector, um, and the voluntary sector. Um, and I wondered what your view was, how we could apply this to the future of our own United Synagogue. Well, that's a question no one's ever asked, asked me, Rabbi Sinister. It was when I made, made the speech. Um, well, I think those sectors have to be linked for the betterment of our society on a macro level. And therefore, if you bring it down to a micro level in terms of our community and our United Synagogue. First of all, United Synagogue is part of our charitable sector. Hence, we have the beautiful shores we have. We have the beautiful uh, Sifrei Torah. These in the main are gifts from the community. We therefore need to link that voluntary sector with the public sector, because United Synagogue has the backing of government. We have honored prime ministers, honored members of cabinet who have been to our shores, who've attended functions, members of the royal family, at the induction of Chief Rabbi Mervis, Prince Charles was there. So working with the public sector for any organization in the charitable sector is crucial. And then basically, if you're looking at the wider world and the commercial um, sector, this is where money is made. This is where business operates. And when you have a business sector that recognizes how crucial the voluntary sector is. When you have a public sector that recognizes how crucial both the voluntary sector is and the commercial sector is, for want of a better word, that's when society will get better. When each of those three arenas dovetail, it means we have a society that cares. Not a neglected voluntary sector, not a neglected public sector, and on a rampant commercial sector, but three sectors that can dovetail, work together for the betterment of our society. That's when I believe our society generally and our country specifically will be at its best. That's Thank why I you. said that in that speech and I still believe it, Rabbi Sinister, to this day. And it, many years later, I think that made the speech, wow, it was 23 years ago. When yeah, I I can, it's resonated, and it resonated with me. My final question before I hand over to Rabbi Black is what message would you have for our young United Synagogue volunteers going forward, to our volunteers going forward to be able to recruit the younger generation? It's a very interesting question. First of all, it is so important that we get our youngsters turned on. 
We need to make Shabbat and Chagim more vibrant, more inspirational. A long time ago, I actually took the children's services at Mill Hill. Um, and I remember, you know, sort of things I did were very different. Pop quizzes, um, fun on Shabbat. Um, and I think, although we need to get the message over, why it's Shabbat, why it's Sachag, we also need to get the youngsters turned on to coming to shore turned on to knowing that helping others is an important part of our lives. And that is so, so important. And today we're blessed with many inspirational young Rabbi Nehman, young Rebetzins, if I may, young, um, you know, people involved in our shores. And mm. we have to lay the foundations for these youngsters to take over. They are our future. That was the reason I decided to become the president of JLGB, um, which is now the youth movement in, in Anglo Jury by, by a long shot. Um, and to me, I get very inspired by seeing youngsters um, taking part. And I often go down on a Shabbos to the children's service. And now we seem to have four or five in Mill Hill and the youth service to see what's going on. Because I just think that's so important. And when I give the leaving lecture, as I always do, unfortunately not this year, to year 13 at JFS as, as the president of the school, I just encourage them to take an active part in communal life. And I always give them a message of chizuk and strength going forward. And we need to teach our youngsters that they need to be proud of who they are, stand up for who they are, and never be ashamed of who they are. When I traveled the world as, as Prime Minister Blair's envoy, every residence, every ambassador's residence that I stayed in knew my kosher requirements. Even in Syria, the late President Assad arranged for kosher food to come in from Turkey for me. And our youngsters need to know they can get as equally as far, they can rise to the top in society without throwing away their roots and without giving up on what they've been blessed with as part of our, our faith and as part of, uh, of Judaism. So that, Reverend Sinister, would be what I would say to our youngsters. And you know, there's nothing more rewarding in life than giving you yourself and volunteering. That's the greatest blessing that we can give. Because you know, we all leave these world, this world with that. All we leave it with is our name and our reputation. And as long as they all understand that, then we're in for a very, very blessed and successful future with our youngsters. Thank you so much. I wish you and Gilza a long and happy life. Thank you ever so much. I'm going to hand over to uh, Rabbi Black and he's going to ask you more. Thank you so much, Robertson Lister. Thank you so much. Um, firstly, I just want to say a really uh, a big welcome from Kenton to everybody out there and a belated mazel tov to you, Lord Levy, for your birthday, it was on the 11th, am I correct? So, it was. Was. and uh, it's really lovely to see you uh, again. I do hope you are well. Um, all the questions this evening have been given to me by community members. So, my first question was submitted to me by David Harris, the retired deputy headmaster of the JFS. It's a double question. You were involved in the transition of JFS from Camden Town to its present campus in Kenton in 2002. You continually take an interest in what is going on. Indeed, you are its president and you have brought over the years many outstanding speakers to come and speak to the students. What is it about JFS that caused you to get involved in the first place. And the second part of this question is, we are living in a world of Holocaust denial and threats to the state of Israel. Has the school got its preparation right for the students to take them into the challenges of a sometimes hostile world for the Jewish people? Are they doing well? 
Well, well, thank you, and please pass my warmest regards to David Harris. I remember him um, very well. And you're a gentleman as well as a Rob that you didn't say how old I was, you see. But I, I'm prepared to do so. Thank God um, um, the Abrister should take care of me. I was 76 last Shabbat. Wow. Um, it's a wonderful so, country. Uh, so here we go, your two-part question. The late Joe Wageman, whom I had the utmost respect and admiration for, was head teacher in Camden. She found out that my late father over Sholem went to Jewish free school, as it was, when it was in the East End. And she became, using Rabbi Shoffert's uh, expression from Jeff, the Boston Strangler, and she got hold of me and said, Michael, you've got to help us at JFS, and we want to move from Camden to a new site. We've outgrown Camden. Look at the building, it's falling down. We really want you involved with the school. I had nothing to do with JFS other than I knew that my late father had been a pupil at the Jewish Free School. So that in itself, to me, was um, honouring his memory, as it were. And I said to Joe, yes, I will get involved. I literally took a year out because I was doing so many other things and raised the money to build the school, which 20 odd years ago was, I think I brought in about 14 million, which was a lot of money then. And we have the most incredible campus at JFS um, for future students. And this academic year, I'm delighted to say there'll be 2,100, a full um, quota of students um, at JFS um, from the September term. Please God, the kids will all be able, able to go to school. So that's what turned me on. That's what attracted me. Um, and that's why I've always got very exciting speakers to come to the school each year for the graduation ceremony. And JFS is something that is, is very close to my heart. And I host each year the head boy and head girl team at the House of Lords for Tea. And nothing gives me greater pride than to see them. Uh, and I introduce them to so many other members of the Lords and I go to great kick saying these kids are from JFS and I think it's a terrific school. Um, now you ask the second part of that question. No matter how good an education is, the real test is when you go out into that big wide world, when they go onto university, when they go onto campus, and when they face their first hostility, whether it's anti-Semitic, whether it's Holocaust denial, whether it's derogatory comments on Israel that are unjustified. You're never totally prepared for it until it actually happens. What we try and do at JFS is to make sure that the students have a knowledge of their Judaism, have a knowledge of the Holocaust and what happened and know the facts and know the facts relevant to Israel. So if they're faced with hostile, and when I say hostile questions that often are not based on factual reality, that they have the facts available to them to deal with those issues. I think that's the best any school can give, whether it's JFS or any school, whether that be some of our other Jewish schools, or in the wider society where they have their Jewish societies and Jewish education programs. I think that's the best Rabbi Black that one can give. But the reality is always one one is faced with that instant, whether it's, as I said, anti-Semitic, Holocaust denial, nastiness, um, really vociferously um, anti-Israel questions, all one can do is prepare students that you give them the facts, you give them the knowledge, and that you give them really an education and the strength of character, by the way, and the confidence that they know they can stand up to anybody if they have the facts at their fingertips. I'm not saying we'll always succeed at JFS or other Jewish schools, but I think it's a very important part of the education and curriculum, and I hope David Harris will endorse that in terms of our youth 
and our going out from school into wider society. I'm sure he will. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, my, my, my next question was submitted by my vice chairman, Roy Block. Um, when you came to Kenton to speak some six years ago, and we all remember it, um, you said that you never compromised on Kashrut throughout your travels. You always kept kosher. When you met such personalities as Yasser Arafat, etc., how did you make sure that your kashrut requirements were kept to the full? Wow. If you're saying to me, Rabbi Black, did I travel with the mashkiach? No. <laughs> I, didn't say, I, didn't, I didn't have my own personal shoma with me. No. And obviously, you have to do your best. I always said, I'm vegetarian, therefore no meat could be served, no shellfish or anything like that. There were vegetables that were served to me, as I said, in Syria. They actually did bring in um, kosher food, although from Turkey, although it wasn't exactly great. Um, every embassy knew my dietary requirements up front, where I obviously stayed in the residence of the, of the ambassador. Um, but it's amazing, Rabbi Black, the respect you get with these leaders when they know your requirements and they know that you stick to your principles and they have an understanding. And when Gilda and I went to number 10 often for dinner with uh, the Blairs, with Tony and Cherie when he was prime minister, and as I call it, the flat above the, uh, the shop in the flat above number 10, he loved Gilda's cooking and very often um, Gilda used to take the food, heat it up in the flat, and that's how we did it there, so it was very easy. Um, I remember on one occasion, um, he actually, the number 10 phoned through to the office and say, will you tell Lord Levy, Lady Levy doesn't need to bring food, the Prime Minister's arranged kosher food. And in actual fact, it was, it was very top of the uh, range. Tony Page um, catered a dinner for the four of us. And I'll never forget this because Tony likes to run in the kitchen, get a beer before he had dinner ran in the kitchen, came out white. There was a mashkeach in the kitchen, netted up with uh, uh, netting over his, uh, over his beard. And Tony literally came out and said, Michael, I don't know if I can do this again. I thought Al-Qaeda had got in our kitchen. Um, but I didn't travel with a shoma. I didn't travel with a mashkeach. All one can do, Rabbi Black, is to do the best one can. And I have to say, I can't think of one incident where respect wasn't shown for my dietary requirements. Now, am I going to say the plate didn't have something on it before I had a vegetable on it? I wouldn't go that far. That would be that would be ludicrous. But I did my best in every possible way, um, and I think that is the um, the best one can do. But just another amusing anecdote with um, Arafat: the highest honor you can give a guest in that world is to take some food from your plate and put it on your honored guest plate. And that's what he did. And I have to tell you, I couldn't eat it. I just played around with the food, made out I was eating, but just couldn't eat it. That, that was just that little bit too far. So, uh, you know, there are, there are a number of amusing anecdotes. I'll limit myself just to a few. But there's the answer to your question. I did my best as a truthful answer. <laughs> that was a worthwhile anecdote. Thank you very much. I have um, one more question for um, from uh, Shana Kinsley. Um, this one's a, a difficult one. Um, it has been reported in the organ of Anglo Jewry, the Jewish Chronicle, that in an interview about Israel, your son had expressed views that were more pro-Palestinian than Israel. How do the views of your son align themselves with your own? Or indeed, do they? Okay. Hard one. So let me answer that question. And it's not an easy question. First of all, I'm an extraordinarily proud father of both my children. And perhaps let me explain to the um, questionnaire and the person who answered the, asked the question as follows. Daniel went through Northwest London, had, and then was a double first from Cambridge. He decided he wanted to devote his career 
um, to the good of society and not going to commerce. He was then at UJS and became the first um, British young man, or woman for that matter, to become the world head of the World Union of Jewish Students and went to Israel. He then decided to make Aliyah and he then went into the Israeli army. He then ended up in the office of the Prime Minister and then ended up Chief of Staff in the Ministry of Justice. He then was at the um, peace talks, the final peace talks on Oslo at Taba. Um, and then he created the Birthright Program, um, which has been an amazing program. He then um, was asked to go to the States and went from Israel to the States. He then uh, disappeared for a few months where he worked on the Geneva Accord, which was the phantom peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. He was then head of the Middle East at European Council of Foreign Relations, and he's now head, the president of the US Middle East Project, not reported correctly, that's what it is. And he has some of the world export experts, excuse me, on this subject on his board, from Chuck Hagel to Tom Pickering, the chair, to the former head of Mossad, Ephraim Halevi, former foreign secretary, Shlomo ben -Ami. And these people absolutely had the utmost respect for Daniel, what he stands for, and what he's trying to do. He's an amazing young man. He's always given myself and Gilda the utmost derech Eretz and respect and honor kibbutz of the aim, respecting parents to the maximum. And as far as I'm concerned, what Daniel is doing to try and help with peace in the Middle East, and sometimes that means being critical of Israel. Number one, he's a man in his own right, he's 52 years old. And number two, he is entitled to his views and what he does and how he does it, I absolutely have the utmost respect for. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like now to hand over to uh, Rabinet Friedman um, from uh, HDS from Hampstead Garden Suburb. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Black. Well, Lord Levy, thank you for joining us this evening. You know, uh, Rabbi Shachat opened up with you being called a the Boston Strangler. And when we first met, <laughs> Back in January, um, you were far from it. You know, we back in Israel in with the World Holocaust Forum. You were there, taking us by hand with my husband, and introducing us to many different people, from former Chief Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau to uh, Sheldon Allison, and it was really fascinating. And we really uh, appreciate that and never forget that. And when I got back, I was like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> and um, our colleague, uh, Gail Kravitz, who is a member, along with yours in Mill Hill, a daughter of Anthony, said, oh, here's his book. And so that's what I did during COVID. <laughs> I read your book to know who, who you are. And fascinating, fascinating story. So my first question to you is, um, what's your involvement with the World Holocaust Forum? How, how did you get involved? I know you were there last year as well. The, the year, I guess it was five years ago when they did it. Um, how did you get involved with that? And, and what's your connection? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, it was a pleasure to have met you, Rabbi Friedman, and your and your husband, the Rob, um, in Israel, and it was uh, a real pleasure and honor for me to take you around and and really, as it were, introduce you to so many people. It was my pleasure and honor. So the World Holocaust Forum has been very heavily subsidized and funded by the Cantor Charitable Foundation. Um, and I'm privileged to be one of the three trustees of the foundation. Um, Dr. Moshe Cantor is basically his foundation. I'm the only non-family member that's a trustee, and the other trustee is his niece, uh, Luba. And so we are the trustees of a, a very, I believe today, one of the important charitable foundations. 
and this is a very important subject to the Charitable Foundation. And I helped put together that amazing um, event um, that took place at Yad Vashem in Israel. One of the most emotional events, um, Rabbi Nat Friedman, I think my memory serves me correctly, there were 48 heads of state there and it was something like anything any of us who attended will ever forget. Absolutely. So my association is through the um, Cantor Charitable Foundation, of which I'm honored to be um, one of the three trustees. Yes, it was definitely a, a memorial event that will, <laughs> unbelievable. And so, you know, being new to the country, I, I didn't know your story. I didn't hear the story of Cash for Peerage. And so reading your book was uh, really, really amazing, fascinating, fascinating read. Um, and the question to you is, you know, knowing that someone was out to destroy you, literally your reputation, who you were, how did you get through that? How did you every day, you know, be able to stand up strong and still go forward? I'm not free from that. That's a, a tough question. The answer is with great difficulty. When you're in the front line in politics, it's a rough ride. When you put your head above that parapet, you know that people are going to shoot it down. And I beat the Tories at their game. I raised probably over 100 million for the Labour Party. It never happened in the history of the Labour Party. I took the party from being totally dependent on the unions, and they're very important to work with them. And it was, it was historic. And I was a great conduit to beat up on the Prime Minister, to beat up on Blair. And in many ways, I was an easier target than to beat up on the Prime Minister. It was rough, but you would always see me, hopefully I would, you know, suited and booted, as they say, publicly, hopefully with a smile on my face, Boy, when I was at home, I'd sit there and probably a pair of shorts and think, you know, what is going on in my life? I, you know, I've never been through anything like this. I've never done anything wrong. I, I didn't, I couldn't decide who would go into the Lords. The whole thing was just contrived. So I knew that there was nothing to it. But you know, when the media are on a rampage and you're learning what's going on from the media, it was very tough and very rough. And often our lane where we live, you couldn't get to our gates because the, the media crews outside. So it was a very tough period, but I always knew that I, you know, there was nothing to it. Um, but there's a word called emuna, and I had faith. In my study at home, I had two portraits of mummy and daddy. I often looked at them asked for their bracha. I have to say Rabbi Shochet was tremendous during this period and gave me great chizuk. Um, but to say, Rabbi Friedman, it wasn't a tough period would be an absolute understatement. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. And you look back and you think, my God, till it happened, it was very tough for Gilda. Our son, Daniel, at the time, was uh, living and working in Washington. He was living there with his wife, um, who's Israeli, and our daughter was uh, here. Um, and it was, it, it was really rough. Um, but if you know that you haven't done anything wrong, if you know that you can stand up and be counted and totally innocent and know the whole thing is politically motivated and contrived, and you do have emuna. Um, I won't say that I didn't govern with a little more kavana, with a, a little more fervor during that period, but at the end of the day, um, I knew there was nothing to it. But having said that, um, there were moments when I was really, really down, and Gilda, particularly, my kids were incredible, our close friends, um, and I've said, Rabbi Shochet, they were. They were fantastic and they really stood behind me. Every charity I worked for uh, that I headed, they were amazing. And, you know, you come through. There are trials and tribulations that are given to us, right? From Abraham with Yitzhak, the Akeda, 
we all have our tests and we all have to come through those tests and we've got to come through to the best of our ability we've got to have strength and we've got to have emuna and that saw me through it but i sure wouldn't like to go through anything like that again in life it was a very very tough and difficult um period in in my life that's for stuff yeah. absolutely i mean uh, de god definitely did uh, test you i mean to get that phone call on your birthday on july 11 that's how you start off the book is uh is one, is one way to, to definitely get tested so so everything after everything you did for the labor party you know like you said you know started off all up and running how do you feel about it a year ago and how do you feel about it today you know, politics, Reverend Friedman, is a pendulum. When I got involved with Blair, I questioned him on what he felt about community. I questioned him on Israel. And in actual fact, um, we were together at uh, Rabin Zifwani Brachaz, the virus funeral. And I remember now, Tony was then leader of the Labour Party, not Prime Minister had a little room in the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, and I took up one after the other from Shimon Peres, as it was then, down and introduced them. And I remember he said to me, he said, Michael, if I'm lucky enough to be prime minister, I want to have an involvement in this um, process. And he kept to his word. I joke he has more yarmulkes, more kippot than I've got, because every time he went to an event, I would give him a yarmulke, and he never gave it back to me. So I guess he's got them collected in some cupboards. He loved coming here for Shabbat dinner. I got him when he was prime minister to do the first ever Hanukkah candle lighting at Downing Street. It's the first time it had ever happened. And I believe he was truly a Chabet Tov Shem Yehudim and um, Chabet Tov Shem Medina. I think he was a really true friend of our community and a true friend of Israel. And our community in the main loved him, but you know, politics, you go in a booth and you decide who you want to vote for. And it's not up to anybody to dictate or determine to anybody how they vote. And, but I do believe swathes of our community switched to Labour, switched to him. Every organization wanted him to speak. I think I can say that I virtually got him to speak at every organization. I remember when I got him for Rabbi Pinter's Zichrani Bracha, I got him to open the Soda Torah Girls' School in Stanford Hill. I remember that people in number 10 said, Michael, you're out of your brains. He won't do that. And I said, let me put it to the test. I went and I said, Tony, I want a personal favor. You're going to experience something you've never experienced. It's an ultra-Orthodox Girls' School. Rabbi Pinter is an exceptional man. Um, do this. And he said, well, what does it mean? I said, well, the first thing is, everyone surrounding you is going to have a big black hat. It would just be you and me with the small, these small yarmulkes that I wear that I'll give you. Secondly, you don't put your hand out to any woman to shake the hand. And lastly, you're going to have an unbelievable experience and see a whole different side of life. And he said, that sounds a good deal to me. I'll do it. The staff at number 10 thought, oh, I don't know what, what's Levy done again. And it was a wonderful experience for him, and he still spoke about it. Um, so really, that's merely an example of how he was so solidly behind our community. And I believe that was then. a true, true friend of Israel. Yeah. Roll the clock forward. Gordon Brown was a good leader, good to our community, good to Israel. Roll the clock forward. Ed Miliband was probably par of. He was uh, okay, but certainly not inspirational, roll the clock forward, and then you have Jeremy Corbyn. One of the most of difficult, the most difficult periods in the life of Anglo Jewry in this country with the Labour Party. And now the EHRC, the Conscious and Human Rights Commission report, or it's actually out, but one doesn't know the content yet. Um, I think it's going to be another very difficult period when that report um, officially comes out. And it's been a terrible period. And for me, I made the decision, and I spoke to Tony Blair, and I made the decision 
that it was right for me to stay in the party. I would have had a few weeks of headlines, I'd have done every bit of media, why I left Labour. Instead, I took every opportunity to be critical and vociferously critical of Corbyn. If any, any of you, those listening in, watching this, saw the interviews that I did, whether it be Today program, Newsnight, Sky, BBC, whatever it was, I did a lot of media. I could not have been more critical of Corbyn because I really thought he was just not the right leader and his behavior pattern was such that it just was very, very bad for our community. He's gone. I decided to stay in because I think it's better to fight from within where my voice could be heard than be outside and then okay, I could have gone out and then come back. But I was appointed a Labour peer, not a crossbencher, and I decided to stay in. There is a new leader of the party, Keir Starmer. We will wait and see what happens. So far, he has made the right noises and he's making the right attempts. But Ramanat Friedman, I want you to know that anti-Semitism and all forms of racism are abhorrent. And I've taken a number of peers into the Lords, and as you know, when you go into the Lords, you have two supporters who take you in. And I've been told on a number of occasions when I took in a new Labour peer from the Tory benches, it was heard to say, oh, who's the Jew boy bringing in now? So this is just not an issue that affected the Labour Party. <coughs> Excuse me, it affected it very badly when Corbyn was the leader of the party. And frankly, he just didn't have an understanding of what our community was about. I hope things have now changed. I hope Keir Starmer is going to be a strong and solid leader of the Labour Party. Every country needs a strong opposition. We didn't have a strong opposition over the years when Corbyn was leading the party. I hope and pray that Starmer will give that leadership there will be a strong opposition. But as I said, uh, Rabbi Nat Friedman, at the beginning of this interview, I don't want this to be a political interview. Um, as I said, I've done enough of those. But there is your answer. And has it been easy to stay in the Labour Party during this period? Absolutely not. It's been terrible. And when people have come up to me and, and they've said, Michael, we love you. You do so much for our community. But how can you stay in the Labour Party? and answer them, I'm polite with them, I'm honest with them, although sometimes it aggravated me and irritated me greatly, but I answered them and gave the same explanation to them as I've given to you this evening. Well, thank you, that's, that's very powerful. The amount of time you invested and everything that you've been through, you stuck it through and like you say, you know, it's a, sometimes it's better to work than when you're out. Um, so we're coming towards the end. I just wanted to also, you know, you, you know, they call you the Jew boy, but you know, you, not only do you wear your your identity, your Jewish identity, on your arm, but you wear your Yiddishkeit, your Frumkeit, and you're very, very proud of it. And it's and I, like you, like you said, you know, you you're a real ambassador to the younger generation to not be afraid to ask for that kosher food, to ask to to, to make sure um, they know who they are. So Yashikoach to you. And thank you, thank you very much, Lord Levy, for giving us your time. We know you're a very busy man. Um, and everything that you did and continue to do for our community and this country uh, and for Israel. Uh, I wanted to thank Rabbi Shachat for orchestrating all this. Uh, he, he may not uh, play tennis along with, I know we, we didn't bring up the tennis bit, but I know that's a big passion of yours. <laughs> I actually you know, practiced a little bit this morning to get into the mode. <laughs> um, and, um, I know he has a good breakfast with you. And it's really been a real honor to be part of this panel alongside uh, yourself, Rabbi Shachat, and Rabbi Black, and Rabbi Lister. And thank you to Michael Goldstein, the president of the United Synagogue. Thank you for all your tireless work hours behind the scenes to make everything run like clockwork. And I also want to mention your late father, Jerry al Shalom, whose greatest nachas is really seeing you as president of the, United, of the US. So um, thank you very much. And mazel tov on reaching this great milestone. Thank you all for tuning in and have a good night.
We are United! I am Woodside Park. I am Kingsbury United. We are Stanmore and Cannons Park United. I am Radley United. We are Palmer Street and Southgate. I am St. Urban Store. We are Borum West and Alstray Shore. We are Birmingham Central. We are Mill Hill. I am Hampstead Garden Suburb Cynical. I am Bushy United. I am Enfield and Witchell Hill United. I am Shenley United. We, we are Richmond! I am Mill Hill East Jewish Community. I am Hines Park and Sheenford Synagogue. We are South London United. We are Chico and Hainal United. I am Hendon United Synagogue. I am Kenton United. I am Highgate Synagogue. We are the New West End. I'm Woodford Forest United. We, we are Edgeway United. United. We are Cock Fosters. And North Southgate United. United. I am Rysett United. We, we are St John's, John's Wood. I am Northwood United. I am Belmont United. We're, We're from Potters Bar United. United. Hi. From Wembley United. I am a Magana Vot. I am a Havat Israel. I am Finchley United Synagogue. We, we are Barnet United. I am Golders Green United Synagogue. I am Bronsbury Park. I am Watford United. I am Hampstead United. I am Central Synagogue. I am Luton United. We are Welling Garden and Hatfield United Synagogue. We are, we are Hadley, Hadley at the East London, London Synagogue. Synagogue. We are Hadley Wood Jewish Community. We are Cranbrook United. I am Ealing United. I am Kingston and Surbiton United. We are Pigeon Park Synagogue. We are Alade Sion. We are Sheffield United Synagogue. We are Muswell Hill Synagogue. I am Sutton and District United. We are Southampton! We are the United Synagogue. Happy 150th anniversary to the United Synagogue. And here's to the next 150 years.